There is a very, very important event in chapter 14 of Revelation. It is the key to unlocking a major mystery. I don't want you to miss it. The end time Babylon is introduced for the very first time in the book of Revelation in chapter 14. She is introduced as fallen, that is destroyed. You may be wondering, wait, how is she destroyed already if she hasn't even been introduced? And I've said many times in previous teachings that the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. You have to put the timeline together yourself. God organized it by theme and thought with a general order of events. If you want a perfect chronology, you have to do a little reorganizing. Hi, this is George Chuang. The theme of Revelation 13 was the two beasts. Now that the Lord has informed you of the Antichrist and the false prophet, the Lord moves on to the Great Tribulation in chapter 14. Let's begin. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. This takes us back to the beginning of the Great Tribulation, when God sealed the 144,000. Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. These men are considered the first fruits of the Great Tribulation. There is an event before the Great Tribulation that leads many people to Jesus, and that is the rapture of the church. After the rapture, boom, you immediately have a huge harvest. Millions will turn to Christ. The 144,000 will be the first fruits of that harvest. Now let me discuss the rapture for just a second. There are lots of people who don't believe there will be a rapture, and that's okay. There are great Bible teachers on both sides of the rapture debate. They both make excellent points, and when you have studied all the scriptures, it's easy to see where they are coming from. It's all about how you interpret the verses. And I've heard people from the no rapture camp say, Oh, those poor rapture people will fall away in the great tribulation when they find out there's no rapture. Or these people will worship the Antichrist. And those are such foolish arguments. True believers don't fall away because of great tribulation. Plenty of rapture-believing Christians have been brutally tortured, burned to death, and suffered all kinds of brutality, and none of them fell away because they believed in the rapture. In the great tribulation, you'll just get your head cut off. Easy stuff. Flip. It's over. I'd happily have my head cut off for Jesus than suffer what some of these precious saints have suffered throughout history and even today. The Great Tribulation is considered the worst time in history because of the number of people that will die, not because of unimaginable torture you'll suffer, although it will indeed be a terrible time. But here is the most important thing. Whether there is a rapture or no rapture. Now, one camp is going to be wrong. There will either be a rapture or not. But here's the most important thing. If there is a rapture, you will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. If there is no rapture, then Jesus comes at the end of the Great Tribulation. And then you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So. If you have not been changed, 
then don't worship anyone who says they are God and wants you to worship them. If a man does great signs and wonders and says, I am Jesus, worship me, don't worship them if you are still in your mortal body. At the end of the Great Tribulation, Jesus comes back to earth with the saints on white horses. If there is no rapture, then you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye at that moment. If there is a rapture, then you have less to worry about because you'll be taken to heaven and you'll see Jesus. Those on earth just need to wait until Jesus comes back to earth on a white horse with the saints. Just wait about seven years and the Lord will return. However, if the rapture occurred, then you won't be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the end of the Great Tribulation because it already happened at the rapture. If there is no rapture, then you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the end of the Great Tribulation when Jesus comes back. Our transformation will either take place at the rapture or at the end of the Great Tribulation. So here's the simple recap. Whether you believe in the rapture or not, while we wait for Jesus, we never worship any man on earth unless you're in a new immortal body and you've been changed into a heavenly body, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15. But we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. If you haven't been changed in a twinkling of an eye, you don't worship any man on earth. It really is that simple, folks. If there is a rapture and you got left behind, just wait about seven years, try to survive, and Jesus will return on a white horse with the saints on white horses. Nothing to it. Verse 5. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The 144,000 are Jews chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there are millions of Jews today, but God is only choosing 144,000 because these are godly men. There is no deceit in their mouth. Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. If the end-time Elijah and the church don't finish taking the gospel to all nations, then this angel will finish the job. Jesus said this gospel will be preached to all nations, then the end will come. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The angel says, For the hour of His judgment has come. Underline this in your Bible. This is very important for us because it gives us a time frame. It's the beginning of the judgment, the beginning of the great tribulation. Verse 8, and another angel follows saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This end time Babylon is introduced for the first time in this book. She is introduced as fallen. That is, she has already been burned. It likely just happened. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. She was probably burned not too long ago. Later in chapter 17, we will read the ten horns, that is the ten kings, will burn this Babylon with fire. This is a very important event. I'll come back to this later. Now remember, verse 7 told us the hour of his judgment has come. That means the great tribulation is beginning. But mystery Babylon is already fallen. Remember this. This is important. Mark it in your Bibles. 
Mystery Babylon has already fallen at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now the question arises, can one be saved if they take the mark of the beast and repent? I hold the view, yes, you can. Get rid of the mark and turn to Jesus. I hold this view because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. The blasphemy of the Spirit has nothing to do with the mark of the beast. Jesus said this when the Jews called the Holy Spirit unclean. Did Jesus not know about the mark of the beast? I'm sure Jesus knew about it because he talks about the coming abomination of desolation. Jesus knows about the Antichrist. Now some people are afraid they may have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, if you are concerned about it, then no, you didn't. To blaspheme the Spirit is to say, I don't want that Spirit Jesus has. It's unclean. That's what they accused Jesus of. They said he had a demon. If you believe in Jesus and you want the Holy Spirit, then you can't commit blasphemy of the Spirit. If you reject Jesus and his Holy Spirit, there is no way for you to be saved because Jesus said he was the only way to the Father. To reject Jesus is to blaspheme the Spirit. One of the main jobs of the Holy Spirit is to get people to believe on Jesus. If you harden your heart and refuse to respond, that ultimately leads to blaspheming the Spirit. You will not be forgiven that. Now back to the mark of the beast. The context is really about those who worship the beast. They do it, not that they have repented from it and cannot be saved. Now if the text said those who take the mark can never be saved and there is no forgiveness for those who take the mark, then that's a sealed deal. I wouldn't attempt to teach otherwise. But the verse says if anyone worships the beast and takes the mark, if this is the path you have chosen, then you'll get the wrath of God and you can't be saved. If you have taken the mark, then repent, flee for your life, and get your head cut off for Jesus. Some people are incredibly legalistic and think Jesus is a legalistic judge. Yes, you got your head cut off for me, but remember, you took the mark that day when they were implementing it. There is no forgiveness for you. I can't see the heart of God in that. The closer I get with the Lord, the more of His heart I feel. Some people feel God is all about following these doctrinal beliefs perfectly and doing them. There are so many doctrines people get hung up on. And I feel God saying this is not what Christianity is about. Christianity is not about trying to figure out what God didn't make clear in the Bible and you getting hung up on it and you attacking other believers because they don't see your point of view. I'd much rather focus on what God did tell us. Scriptures that are clear, plain, and simple. How we ought to live. How we ought to love. This is what you'll get rewarded for. Now I want you to pay special attention to verse 13. 
This verse unlocks a major mystery in this book. The second angel just proclaimed, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That was the angel's job. What's the purpose of the proclamation? I don't know, but it certainly does one thing. And that one thing is give us a time frame of when these things happen. Now let's read verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So Mystery Babylon has just fallen. It wasn't too long ago. Then a voice from heaven tells John to write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. When we get to Revelation 19, the same event is described in detail. Revelation 19 is the time when Mystery Babylon is burned. Revelation 14 is after she is burned. The proclamation, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is to inform us that she has already fallen. So Revelation 19 is just a little bit earlier in time. The world is watching her burn in chapter 19. Now, some people assume Mystery Babylon will be burned at the end of the Great Tribulation because it's described in chapter 19, just before Jesus returns. But they don't realize the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. God already told us Babylon was fallen in chapter 14, and that's the beginning of the Great Tribulation. As it says, for the hour of his judgment has come. I'll say it again. Chapter 14 is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. That's why an angel goes out at the beginning to proclaim the gospel. Then another angel goes out and says, don't take the mark of the beast. Now, if you can repent of it, why not take the mark? Because that might just seal your fate and you get God's wrath poured out on you. So don't do it. Now, if Mystery Babylon is burned at the end of the Great Tribulation and these three angels are sent out at the end of the Tribulation, what would be the point of their proclamation? The first angel goes out, believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's all these dead people lying on the street. Billions of dead people. You're a little late with that gospel, aren't you? Second angel goes out, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Third angel goes out, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't take the mark of the beast? It was implemented seven years ago. Where were you seven years ago when we were all getting the mark? Listen, God always gives early warning. He never warns you after it happens. That would be as if Noah gave the warning of the flood after the flood happened. Let's preach to these corpses. What's more logical is that an angel goes out and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ before the people die in the tribulation. Another angel goes out and warns people against taking the mark of the beast before it's fully implemented. This makes much more sense. And we were told for the hour of his judgment has come. That means it's the beginning of his judgment. Now as Mystery Babylon is being burned and the world is watching her burn in chapter 18 and 19, this is what we read starting in Revelation 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Stop right here. Mark this down in your Bibles. The same event is happening in Revelation 14 and 19. 
The only difference is that Revelation 19 is a little bit earlier in time than Revelation 14. In Revelation 19, Babylon is burning. In Revelation 14, Babylon is fallen. So as Babylon is burning, John is told to write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why? Because it said in verse 7, For the marriage of the Lamb has come. This is just before the Great Tribulation. If you are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, then you are blessed. Why? Because you don't have to go through the Great Tribulation. So as Mystery Babylon is burning, very soon after, the rapture will take place. If you go in the rapture and go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, then you are blessed. If you miss the rapture, then you'll be part of those in Revelation 14. Chapter 14 is the beginning of the tribulation. Babylon is already fallen. Revelation 14 a. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And since the rapture already occurred, John is told, writes, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So we have the same event. Babylon is burned, but two different things are said to one group, right? Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. To another group, right? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. You are blessed if you die in the Lord because you'll likely have to die for the Lord during the tribulation. So if you ever wondered why two different things are said at the same event, now you know. The marriage supper will last seven years. Those on earth will have great tribulation. Seven years. The story picks up again in verse 14. Rapture just happened. Those left behind are told they are blessed if they die in the Lord. Verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. One like the Son of Man is usually referring to Jesus. It says like the Son of Man, but as we read on, we'll discover it is Jesus. Why does John use the word like if it's Jesus? Because it's probably Jesus in another glorified form. He doesn't look like the Jesus John walked with on earth. This guy is like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. The word for crown here is Stephanos. It's the same type of crown as the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6, except the Lord's is described as golden. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So this glorious Son of Man has to be Jesus, because it's His harvest. The time has come for Him to reap and harvest the earth. Now why is there suddenly a mighty harvest at this time? Because the rapture just occurred, and many immediately turned to the Lord, who wouldn't if you've been hearing about the rapture all these years and suddenly a bunch of people disappear? So there is an immediate large harvest. Verse 16. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. The great tribulation begins and many people die. From our previous studies, we found that the tribulation begins with the first trumpet with nuclear war. Verse 19, 
So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. It's important to note that this is the wrath of God. Christians aren't appointed to wrath because Jesus already paid the penalty for sin and took God's wrath on the cross. So they will escape all these things as Jesus promised in the rapture. Tribulation saints experience the wrath because they were among the mockers or those who were unworthy of Christ. They can be saved, but they will experience God's wrath for having been mockers or unworthy of the Lord. Verse 20, And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's basically a lot of blood and dead people. Billions of people will die in the Great Tribulation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Your servants wait on you. This is George Chuang teaching from China. You can help support this teaching ministry if it is a blessing for you. The links are down below. Thank you guys for helping me in this work. Don't forget to subscribe. And until next time, let us continue to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.